Okay, so last week we dealt with the question of idealism and the problem of knowledge, and we looked at the ways in which um, it was proves impossible to solve the problem of knowledge uh, if you examine thoughts for, on an individualistic basis, basically, if you tear it from its social and historical conditions. Um, and, you know, if you start out from the position of an abstract individual, it will be impossible to really explain thought. Um, and now we have to move on to the, this, if you like, scholastic question, as Marx called it, to the question of what thought really is, what the real process uh, of the development of thought is in real history, rather than just endlessly wondering whether or not it's possible to have knowledge. Um, and this outlook, um, the Marxist outlook on what thought is, and the, the necessity of looking at it in its real history uh, is summed up brilliantly in Marx's famous theses on Feuerbach, written at the beginning of his uh, career, um, in which he shows that um, even um, materialism, the, the materialism that existed prior to Marx, especially in the example of Feuerbach, um, had not really fully broken with idealism. And as a result, uh, it's it st struggled with the same problems of explaining thought. Uh, Marx explains in, in this that, uh, and I quote, Feuerbach wants sensuous objects really distinct from thought objects. In other words, he wants to accept the independence of material reality. He goes on, but does not conceive human activity itself as objective activity. In other words, contained within his uh, philosophy was an, a hidden assumption that somehow, although the material world exists independently of man, mankind, insofar as it thinks, is somehow not part of that world. Um, now, Marx revolutionised uh, in these theses on Feuerbach philosophy, uh, in which are, you know it's only about two pages long. The theses on Feuerbach, so it's an incredibly potent uh, bit of philosophy. Um, and not only does he pose the question historically in terms of you know humanity being a part of uh, the natural world having emerged from the natural world, uh, but he also this uh, this outlook also opens the door to treating thought socially, right, rather than in terms of the isolated individual. Um, and in just two sentences, he really destroys the rigid bourgeois idea of human nature or human essence as he calls it marx says and again i quote but the human essence is no uh, abstraction inherent in each individual in its reality it is the ensemble of social relations so marx explains that feuerbach and indeed in fact anybody who doesn't grasp human nature uh, in this way but instead um, treats it uh, um, or rather must, because they don't treat it in this way, must treat it as in an abstract way and must treat human nature as, uh, because not a product of history and of society, as something that is somehow present from the beginning in each uh, human individual, sort of in its entirety, you know. So each person taken separately has the same dose, if you like, of human nature given to them for some mysterious reason. Um, and uh, if you think about it, this is the same basic standpoint of um, bourgeois people or people who think in a bourgeois kind of way. When they say in response to, for example, you saying that you are a socialist, they might say, oh, well, what about human nature? This is kind of a notorious um, argument that uh, any socialist has to contend with almost on a daily basis. Uh, and the again, the hidden assumption of that is that we have sort of inbuilt within us a rigid human nature that somehow maybe in our genes or in our soul and it's sort of the same in each individual right it's not a product of history it's doesn't it's not found in society and in the particular relations of a given society but is instead just sort of imprinted on each person 100 percent and taken separately um, and therefore the real origins of it remain a mystery for these people there isn't really anything they can say they can just assert that human nature is this way then these theses on Feuerbach end with the famous, probably the most famous single sentence in philosophy, which ironically is the sentence in which Marx essentially shows the limitations of philosophy. When he says uh, famously that philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways, the point is to change it. Uh, and that, you know, really, I think, 
sums up Marxist philosophy in a sense. Now, <clears throat> this this outlook rescues the the problem of mind as it or the mind body problem as it's often called from its abstract one sided treatment in most of philosophy, and it poses the question in its proper context. And it doesn't necessarily provide in itself all of the answers for how we think, but it, it puts in its proper context and allows us to start looking at it in the right way and, and uh, to find the right tools for explaining it. And so materialism now emerges as far more than the mere assertion that the material world exists independently and prior to the thinking individual. Now materialism or dialectical materialism shows that thought is part of the material world. It's not just that it depends on it, it is actually part of the material world. Thought is a natural thing, essentially. Uh, and therefore, it follows that we would be able to change the material world with our thoughts, since it is part of the material world, right? So thought is treated now, unlike in Feuerbach and other earlier materialists, thought is treated as active and not passive. Uh, and in fact, thought can only be thought precisely because it is active. That's what distinguishes it from mere sensation, right? Uh, which simply sort of registers uh, what is happening to the body. But thought is able to then react back upon the natural world, precisely because it is part of the natural world. It's made of the same stuff, effectively, or comes from the same stuff. Um, Marx also explains in the 1844 manuscripts, which were written around the same time, um, that man must have an object to be, uh, must be an object rather, to have an object. Um, in other words, again, we are part of nature. And this, this again is a, a very revolutionary way of thinking about the problem at the time. Um, there is fundamentally no barrier between our thoughts and the material world, since our thought is a product of one part of the material world. And in order to think, we must every day breathe in fact, every, every second we must breathe, every day we must eat, we must drink, and we must find shelter. Um, and all of our powers, including thought, are natural powers, which we direct towards survival in the, in the natural physical world, right? And if we stop doing that, then of course we would stop thinking. Um, and so as Marx says, and I quote again, a being which does not have its nature outside of itself, in other words, what he means is, does not depend on the natural world to, to exist, um, in other words, have to eat and things. A being which does not have its nature outside itself is not a natural being, plays no part in the, in the system of nature. A being which has no object outside itself is not an objective being. A being which is not itself an object for some uh, third being has, has no being for its object, i.e. it is not objectively related. Its being is not objective. A non-objective being is a non-being. Now, translating that into uh, plain English, what he's arguing against essentially is any kind of non-materialist worldview that would have things like God, the soul, or ghosts, or anything like that as these fund defined as fundamentally non-material, as spiritual beings or something, um, and standing outside of the natural world. And what he's saying is that essentially, well, as soon as you define it in that way, you're effectively admitting it doesn't exist, since to exist means to interact with the rest of the world or physical objects. And to be able to do so, you have to be part of that world. You have to yourself be physical, essentially. Um, and that applies, of course, to any not just those who believe in God or talk about ghosts, but also those who, idealists who would argue that, the, that thought is fundamentally non-material or cannot know the material world because it's a, a different thing uh, to it. Um, and therefore, because we are natural to our core, we are fundamentally natural beings. Nothing about us is non-natural or immaterial. Um, and therefore, we need the rest of nature to survive. We must eat, we must drink, etc. Um, then, as a result of this, we also suffer because you know we, we can be deprived of those things that we need. Um, which Marx explains again in the 1844 manuscripts. And this then lays the basis for understanding in their proper context all of our emotions, our interests, and therefore ultimately our thoughts, which of course depend upon those things. Uh, we couldn't have 
thoughts if it weren't for the fact that we need certain things. That's what drives thought, essentially. So thought seen in this way is not a magical property. It's not some, some sort of special spiritual substance which is somehow occupying a body, but is instead a product of or a reflection of the, that particular being's, natural being's uh, needs, physical needs, fundamentally. Um, <clears throat> not only this, but Marx also explains that we don't simply interact with nature on an individual basis, but actually through and via society, right? Uh, so, you know, the food that I eat and the clothes that I wear are almost in every case not actually produced by myself, right? They're produced by someone else in society or in reality, many people in society. There's a vast chain of, of labour and exchange which enables um, the production of these things so that I can buy them in shops and use them. That is really how I survive. It's through society. It's not as an independent individual. Very little of what I consume is made by myself, and this applies to everybody. Um, so any attempt to explain how we think and what ideas are that doesn't take into account this fundamental fact of our existence will necessarily be false and abstract and will treat, again, once again, will treat thought as a kind of magical and a, and a mystical and therefore a mysterious substance that uh, comes from, you know, who knows where. Um, so the, the, these writings of Marx are really revolutionary and re retain all of their validity, I think. Now, last week we discussed how philosophers like Hume and Kant uh, concluded that since the ideas that we use to gain knowledge, such as time, cause and effect, since these ideas are very abstract and are not really found in our experience of concrete objects, in other words, I don't experience time itself, um, they concluded that these must be properties of the mind, right, and, and, and fundamentally not of the material world. Um, now, I think we can begin to make sense of that a bit more because you can see the similarity from that point of view with the point that Marx is making about Feuerbach treating human essence or human nature as present in each individual rather than as a historical product and a changing product of history and of society. Uh, and similarly, this, this idea that our ideas and our abstractions are sort of result can you know it's seeing them as products of of the inherent structure of the mind present in each individual and not coming from experience or from the natural world that is a product of the removal of society and history from the study of thought essentially in philosophy um in reality of course our ideas all of our ideas do come from experience, but not the experience of each individual taken separately, but the collective experience of humanity. And that means fundamentally the labor of humanity, the social labor of humanity, the means by which we live. As Engels says, and I quote, mastery over nature began with the development of the hand, with labor, and widened man's horizon at every new advance. Man was con continually discovering new hitherto unknown properties in natural objects. On the other hand, the development of labour necessarily helped to bring the members of society closer together by increasing cases of mutual support and joint activity, and by making clear the advantage of this joint activity to each individual. In short, men in the making arrived at the point where they had something to say to each other. In other words, thought and language developed as a result of the production of tools. Um, the trouble is, however, this history, the real basis of our thought, is, is hidden. It's been forgotten in the passage of time for various reasons. But one reason that it's been forgotten is, of course, the, the onset of class society, in which a layer of society does very little or, or in fact, no labouring at all and lives off the labour of others and instead deals only in ideas and abstractions. In other words, members of the ruling class. And Engels explains this as well. He says, in the face of all these images, that is, culture and religion, which appeared in the first place to be products of the mind, and seem to dominate human societies, the more modest productions of the working hand retreated into the background. The more so since the mind that planned the labour was able, at a very early stage in the development of society, to have the labour that had been planned carried out by the hands by hands other than its own. In other words, he's talking about a ruling class that uses its its education and the development of labour to live off the labour of others and therefore relegated the role of labour in the production of ideas into the background or completely 
disappeared it entirely. Um, <clears throat> so again, understood in this way, we, we, we not only begin to understand uh, the real origins of thought, uh, but we also begin to explain some of the problems of thought. For example, alienation, which is hinted at in the quotation I just gave. If human nature lies in the ensemble of, of social relations and, and in, in real history, um, and it's a product of that history and changes in, with time, and if the individual must live in and through society in order to survive, then of course social problems, social contradictions such as class society are bound to produce psychological problems, if you like. Um, and so in a capitalist society, the one in which we live, the individual of course depends on society for everything, as I've described, uh, but cannot exercise any real control over that society or even understanding. In fact, even bourgeois individuals, business owners, don't really usually understand how capitalism works. In fact, they have an interest in not understanding how it works. And um, they can't control the market, rather the market controls them. So this impersonal market really decides what society produces, who is fired and who isn't, who is paid what, etc. And ultimately decides what is produced and in what quantities. So no real human understanding of the overall process under capitalism uh, is possible. Now, Marx explains that thanks to social labour, um, humans are the very first animals that can um, sort of, well, obviously that think, um, and that can subject their own activity, if you like, to investigation. Uh, other animals, of course, also have to produce things in order to survive, but they, they don't really make tools, or in very rare cases, they do make some very primitive tools, but generally they don't make any tools and they just depend upon their own natural characteristics, their own physical properties in order to survive. And that's what they do one generation to the next. It never changes. They don't develop any culture that learns and transmits certain things. Um, it's, it's true there are some small exceptions to this, but generally that is overwhelmingly the case with all animals. Uh, whereas because we labour and we create tools that are independent of our bodies, uh, we can obviously change these tools, right? We can invent new tools and we can discover new properties and things. And as a result, our tools can be perfected over time. And with that, the way that we work and the things that we produce obviously changes and develops. And therefore, the social structure is changed in this, in this process, right? And therefore, in turn, our ideas, of course, and our culture changes as well. And that's the real kind of basis for our ideas and the real kind of logic to to the development of thoughts over time, um, which of course animals cannot do. Um, <clears throat> however, once again in capitalist society, because it is the market that dictates this process, not conscious human beings, um, that, that it produces how we produce and, and, and what we produce. We lose control over this process. So although in capitalist society we have never before, we have attained a level of, of, of mastery, of tool making if you like, that has never been achieved before. I mean vastly superior to anything that has been achieved before. Our understanding of the properties of the natural world etc is incredible. But at the same time our understanding of our own social structure and our own process of labour is um, has actually fallen in a sense. We have lost control over that. We don't understand the real logic of the market, or Marxists do, but society as a whole does not and cannot uh, do that under capitalism. And so this has a certain effect on our consciousness, a sense of alienation, a lack of control um, over our own fates, you know, a sort of obviously a, a boredom at work, a lack of any connection with what you're producing. What you produce has really nothing to do with what you consume and you don't get any say in uh, what you produce at work. You're told what to do and you might be fired one day and your, your whole community might be destroyed because of certain changes in the productive forces. Maybe, you know, you're in the industry that your community was built around suddenly ceases to be productive and is destroyed and that's it. Basically, your, your town is, is um is ruined essentially. That's the fate of humanity under capitalism. We're all familiar with this idea, right? That that uh, that we that um, the technology that we have sort of is out of our control essentially, and that that this therefore explains um, not opens the door not just to generally understanding how we think, but also to understanding the problems of thought, such as that of alienation. Um, and finally, I just want to also draw attention to. Um, 
a something that may at first appear almost non-materialist in this outlook. Um, this revolutionary understanding of of how we think um, that Marx developed, Marx and Engels developed over 150 years ago, still escapes many. I mean, it's not really taught in schools and it's generally slandered uh, in the education system and in the media. So scientists and philosophers who are concerned with the problem of mind, how we think, basically, generally are ignorant of this, this, this philosophical outlook. And you know, make mistakes. Uh, for example, one of the most common ones in terms of how we think would be for scientists involved in, in the study of the brain and the nervous system to seek an explanation for everything about how we think and why we think purely within the structures of the brain, which first of all, at first glance, appears thoroughly materialist and like something that we would agree with. Now, obviously, we do accept that the brain is 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 the site of thought is you know is indispensable to thought but there's more to it than that trotsky said the following the brain is the material substrate of consciousness does this mean that consciousness is simply a form of manifestation of the physiological processes of the brain if this were the state of affairs then one would have to ask what is the need for consciousness if consciousness has no independent function which rises above the physiological processes of the brain and nerves, then it is unnecessary, useless. It is, a har it is harmful because it, it is a super superfluous complication. And what a complication. Now, this might seem as if he's developing an idealist outlook, saying that the brain has almost got no control over thoughts. Um, but actually, it's nothing of the sorts. There is more to materialism than sim simply explaining the structures of the brain, and there's more to the material foundation of thought than the brain. There's also the question of society, as we have discussed, which is, of course, also a material thing. The brain does not simply equal consciousness, and if it did, then consciousness would merely be a passive byproduct that would never change, like, you know, the bile that is secreted into the body. It would just be a kind of... And in fact, some scientists actually propose this, that maybe consciousness is a sort of, um, like a... A kind of spe or just a sort of accident they even call it like a fluky byproduct of the processes of the nervous system like it's, it basically plays no role it's just a sort of like the cherry on the cake it doesn't add anything it's just like a like a fluid that is secreted by the brain it's something it somehow has the, this property of feeling um and sensation um which of course as trotsky explains well that would be a very expensive and, and kind of ridiculous thing Actually, consciousness rises above, emerges from its material substrate, as Trotsky calls it, and in turn conditions it. And this goes back to our earlier point about consciousness being an active and not a passive thing. It actually changes, it has the power to change one's behaviour, right? Um, and how does it do that? Is that magic? Well, no, the, the real determining factor in thought is society, right? And this is obvious when you think about it. I mean, if, if, if somebody was born with the exact same physical structures let's say they were an identical twin but they were brought up outside of society weren't introduced to language weren't introduced to the discoveries of, of human thought would such a person have the same ideas and think in the same way as their identical twin who had, who was brought up in society clearly they would not so it's the 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 logic of society and the history of society that produces ideas to go back to what we were talking about earlier, it's labor, the labor process, the discovery of tools, uh, the ability to create new things and discover properties. And, and with that, the structure of society changing over time. That's really what produces and determines the ideas that we have. And then we, using our brains, are able to internalize those things and to communicate them with language. Uh, and therefore, our brains kind of become more than the sum of their parts, if you like. They are able to absorb um, things that by purely by their own physical properties, they would not be able to do because of this external social structure, basically. Um, and, and I think this, this, this outlook really often escapes a lot of scientists even working today, um, but it's something that Marxist philosophy is, uh, is more than capable of explaining. Um, now to conclude then, on the same note that we've concluded really the previous weeks, um, since society produces thought, since it is society that produces thought and not simply the brain or the soul or anything else, 
Um, it follows that the problems of society, the contradictions of a society that we have briefly discussed today, would, if you like, inhibit thought, right, and sort of mutilate it in a certain sense and hold it back. So we cannot really call ourselves today a fully self-conscious species, if you like, because we don't, as I discussed, we, we don't control our fate. We don't understand why society does the things that it does, why we have economic crises, for example. Uh, we don't why there is so much greed in society. We don't really understand the, or control these things. Um, and so as Engels says, the, to, to win real self-consciousness for humanity and, and freedom, then humanity mu ultimately requires, and I quote, requires something more than mere knowledge. It requires a complete revolution in our hitherto existing mode of production and simultaneously a revolution in our whole contemporary social order. In other words, we need to socialise the means of production. We need to put into working people's hands real control and conscious control over what they produce and how. Society needs to plan the whole of its production in a harmonious way to meet the needs of humanity. And only when that is done, in other words, when we achieve socialism, can we say that humanity has fully attained to self-consciousness?